record on this computer. All right, so good morning, everyone. Welcome to the unit two review. You should be able to see my screen here in just a second. So the file that we're gonna use today is here in the lecture content unit two folder. I think I'm gonna go off camera to try to make things go faster. My bandwidth is slow. All right, so as always, we're gonna scroll down to the exam two folder. And about halfway down, it says exam two review activities. There are two cahoots posted here. Um, we're not gonna play them right now, but they are available. We are going to use this micro exam two review file. And I'm actually gonna get that pulled up. So if you can make sure you have that handy, we're gonna use that. Oh, I've already got it open, silly me. All right, so remember the exam that is due tomorrow, that is going to cover um, all of lecture unit two. So enzymes, metabolism, microbial growth, and then controlling micro, uh, microbial growth. But one thing I wanna show you before we dive into this review is something that previous students have said are really, really helpful. Um, but I posted it somewhere that I'm not sure y'all y'all found. So going back to lecture content, unit two, going to the controlling micro microbial growth folder, module six. This is where we have um, things like we use moist heat, dry heat, right? All the different forms of control. But at the bottom, we have all of these antimicrobials, okay? And so this is something that people tend to just kind of get mixed up, especially in a five-week class when you don't have a ton of time. Um, it's easy to kind of get these jumbled on an exam. So in my in-person classes, what we normally do, so I'm in the module six resources folder, is I provide this mind map document. And so there's a video here um, where I walk through part of it, how to fill it out. And essentially, let me see if I can open it and blow it up, And but I'm going to pause it. Oh, there's, it's always so weird to see myself. Here we go. Okay. Hopefully can, hopefully y'all can see that. Um, so this is a mind map. And so basically it's just a way of organizing all of these antimicrobials. And so in each color represents a target. So for instance, purple is translation because we have five antimicrobials that target translation. So in each of these ovals, you would put the name of the drug, the antimicrobial. And then in this rectangle is where you put like the mechanism of action. So how it works. Um, so let me see. Remember when I originally recorded this video, there were some technology issues. So that's just how life always works. So for instance, as you can see here, I put this cell wall here and you know which one it is by the number of antimicrobials, right? There's three that we talk about for the cell wall. There's five we talk about for translation. Here you can pick, we have two for the plasma membrane, two for nucleic acids, right? One targets RNA synthesis, one targets DNA synthesis. So as you can see, you put the names of the drugs here and then pardon my horrible handwriting when I try to write with my mouse, um, you're gonna put the mechanism of action. So if you're a visual person, um, cause for me, flashcards are great, but then like I, I memorize the order they're in, and sometimes I just, I have a semi-photographic memory. So having something like this is a lot easier for me to recall. Um, so I did post this in the module six resources, the actual file, um, and then the video where I start walking through, I, I think the technology just quit working um, before I got through all of it, but it gets you going. So if you, this you think would work for you, by all means, just wanna let you know that it's here. Okay. So now let's go ahead and focus on the exam review. Are there any questions before I get started? I have the chat up, but it's not always uh, like the easiest thing to keep track of. I will put it in front of me though, so I can try to think about it. Okay, so if you do have questions, please don't hesitate to come off of mute. Um, we're all friends here. Okay, so for exam two, the first part of unit two is um, enzymes. 
And this is something that hopefully you covered a lot of in your prerequisite course, but honestly, it varies from teacher to teacher, class to class. So um, this first question is really going to be our big review on enzymes. But y'all, enzymes are one of my favorite topics like in all of biology. So make sure you're comfortable with them. Okay, so you're studying the enzyme microase, which has the following shape. So the it's this crazy looking thing over here on the First of all, if I didn't tell you that microase was an enzyme, how would you have known? It has ace. Yes, good job. So it normally, of course, there are exceptions to every rule. A-S-E at the end of a name tells you it's an enzyme. And normally, when it's not made up like this one, the name of the enzyme kind of tells you what it's going to do, right? Y'all saw that in unit one where helicase, helic, sounds like helix, and that one's separated the helix, right? So if it ends in ASE, you know it's an enzyme. So enzymes normally have two shapes. So let me see how this, again, I need to, turn. okay. So enzymes typically have two binding spots on them, okay? Two sites where something can happen. And so can anybody tell me the two names of the sites? Don't be shy. One of them is the active site. Yeah. And the other one, I'm not sure then, is it allosteric? Yes, that's exactly right. All right, so the active site and the allosteric site, I promise you're going to want to remember this. Um, they're the two binding sites. Okay, so as you can see on this picture, we've got a triangular shape and we've got this kind of roundish shape. I don't know if it'll let me move this picture. Okay, if, you're, if you have it open on your computer or printed in front of you, you'll see that I also provided y'all what the substrate looks like. And the substrate um, remember, substrate's the biology word for reactant. It's our starting molecule. So that's going to be what binds to the enzyme, and it will eventually get converted to a product. Okay? So the substrate is always complementary, which means it has a similar shape to the active site. So if we're looking at microase here, and we know our substrate is triangular, and the substrate always binds to the active site, we know that this triangular space here must be our active site. So then by default, I don't know why I'm worrying about these borders. Y'all ever just like obsess about things that you really shouldn't obsess about? That's me right now. This other site where something could bind is called the allosteric site, okay? So the active site is essentially where the magic happens. This is where the substrate will bind, the chemical reaction will occur, and the product gets released from. This is the main site. But we don't need every reaction happening 24-7, 365, right? We need to go to sleep. Enzymes need to be turned off, right? So the allosteric site is a place where a regulatory molecule can possibly bind. We do have what are called enhancers, which kind of turn enzymes on. We don't really talk about those in this class. What we do talk about are inhibitors. Inhibit means to prevent. So when an inhibitor binds, it turns off the enzyme. Okay, so the enzyme no longer works. And it, that can be undone, okay? The, the inhibitor can be released and the enzyme can do its job again. So the allosteric site is really a site of regulation. The active site is where the actual reaction is happening. Okay, so make sure you know those. So one of the things that we do talk about, because it's important for antimicrobials and kind of some other discussions we'll have later in the class, is this types of inhibition that there are. And so I want you to think about, and if you, if you have it handy where you can actually sketch it, sketch what a competitive inhibitor would look like, okay? So obviously on the exam, right, you can't draw something, but I could show you a picture, kind of like you saw on your, was it the, I think the knowledge check where you had to kind of identify uh, what the substrate was, what types of inhibitors were. So let's remind ourselves what competitive inhibition is. 
and I'm going to send this to you. So remember, competitive inhibition is an actual. Oh, did I even spell it? Wow, I was way off, y'all. T I V E. Competitive. There we go. Okay, so it's an actual competition, hence the name. So where on the enzyme do we think is worthy of a competition? The active site, right? Because that's where the reaction is happening. Nobody is going to fight for the allosteric site, right? Because nothing's really going on there most of the time. So the competition is for the active site. Well, doesn't it make sense then that if our inhibitor is going to go after the active site, it's got to look like it, right? It's going to have to be complementary in shape to that, um, to that shape, okay? Because with competitive inhibition, the inhibitor binds to the active site, blocking it. So the substrate cannot bind. And if the substrate can't bind, the reaction can't happen, right? So for this one, you need to know what competitive inhibition is. What site is targeted? What would the inhibitor look like? Well, it's got to look like where it's trying to bind. So if I was asking you to identify kind of like on the weekly activity, we know what the inhibitor might look like. And again, this could vary a lot. I'm just going to give you an option. It could be, is it clicking? Are you going to do this? Here we go. There we go. It could be something like that. Or, let's see, can I undo that? It could be something that's smaller. That's just kind of wedged in here. But the point is it's still triangular and it's blocking part of this, right? So if our substrate, it's not gonna be an exact copy because honestly I don't have it in front of me, so I don't remember what it looks like. If here's our substrate trying to get in, it can't, right? Because this pointy part can't get in there because it's blocked. So our substrate cannot bind, the reaction can't happen. Okay? So that's competitive inhibition. They're competing for this golden site, this active site. So then the, the next part is to sketch what an allosteric inhibitor would be. Or I'm sorry, a non-competitive inhibitor. It's also called an allosteric inhibitor. So you can probably guess where that binds to. That's going to bind over here in the allosteric region. So in order to bind somewhere, it's got to have a similar shape, right? So it would... oh. Oh, I'm still on the eraser. Get it together, Kelsey. So a uh, non-competitive inhibitor would be some shape that allows it to fit in this allosteric site. And what that would actually do, um, let me see if I can do this quickly. Is there no white? Would be too easy. We're going to use gray, but we're going to, oh, you can see that. It's not doing me any favors. Okay, so when a uh, non-competitive inhibitor binds to the allosteric site, it's going to cause a shape change to this enzyme. Because anytime something binds to a protein in general, it changes shape, right? Just like if we suddenly catch a ball in our hand, our hand has changed shape. If you pick up a child, right, your body is now in a different shape. So when something binds, changes happen to the shape. So when a non-competitive inhibitor binds, it's going to change the shape of the enzyme in such a way that now that triangular substrate, it doesn't fit. Okay. And so now the enzyme's not going to work because the substrate can't bind. Okay. So again, just to kind of summarize this with non-competitive inhibition which is also called allosteric inhibition. On your exam, it will say non-competitive. I apologize. That probably should have said non-competitive right there. Um, remember, this is where the inhibitor binds allosteric site, which is going to cause um, the active site to warp. Warps active site, so it's no longer complementary to, um, to the shape of the substrate. Do we have any questions on that? I don't know why this formatting is being so weird. Okay, well, so let's list some features of enzymes. Enzymes are going to be proteins. That's very important. 
And it's important because they can denature in certain environments. That means they fall apart. Okay? Remember we talked about the pH. If it's too acidic or too basic, we're gonna have the environment has acquired either a lot of H pluses, hydrogen protons, if it's acidic, or hydroxide ions, OH negatives. And the, having this extra amount of charges will actually pull on the ionic bonds holding a protein together. And it'll just tug at that protein until it falls apart. With temperature, it can cause uh, denaturation because remember, as um, an environment gets hotter, molecules move faster, right? And so imagine right, if a kid has a toy and they start shaking it and they just shake it harder and harder and harder, there's a good chance eventually that toy is going to break, right? Same thing with an enzyme. The faster and faster it moves, the, the more likely those bonds are going to break because it becomes brittle and it falls apart, okay? So high heat can cause the protein to denature. And again, denature means it loses its shape. And if it loses its shape, it loses its function. Okay. So let's remind ourselves of that. Loses shape and therefore it loses its function. So the protein doesn't work and organisms die. And I'm going to modify this to say high temperature. Remember, in cold temperatures, all that happens is the enzyme slows down because with cold temperatures, molecules slow down. And that just means if the enzyme is moving really slow, it's going to take longer for it to bind its substrate, longer to produce a product. So the enzyme still works. It's just moving really slowly. All right. Does anybody else rem um, remember a feature of an enzyme? They are recycled. Okay, so remember what that means is the enzyme does its job. It binds a substrate, it produces the product, and then it finds a new substrate, produces a product, finds a new substrate, produces a product. The enzyme is not permanently altered in any way during the reaction. Okay, we need thousands and thousands of different enzymes, and we need multiple copies of that enzyme it wouldn't make any sense for us to destroy the enzyme every time we used it, right? That would require so much energy to keep mass producing enzymes. It doesn't make any sense. So these proteins are um, constantly recycled. They are not modified. The last thing I really wanna emphasize is that they are specific, okay? They are specific for one reaction and therefore they're specific for the substrates of that reaction. Sometimes there's one substrate in a reaction, maybe molecule A gets converted to molecule B, but sometimes there are more complex reactions where A and B come together to form molecules C and D. In that case, there'd be two substrates, but it would always only be those same two substrates, okay? So an enzyme is specific for one single reaction and therefore, those specific substrate or substrates uh, for that reaction, okay? All right, those are kind of like the big things that I wanted to mention about enzymes. Anybody have any questions? Feel free to put something in the chat or come off mute. Can you give me an example of, um, like I can visualize what you're talking about with the enzymes, but can you <laughs> give me an example of like the a reaction that one would cause if it's recycled and like producing the same effect with the substrates what like what would an enzyme do specifically so I can like yeah it. so for instance with um glycolysis part of respiration mm -hmm. um there are it's actually glycolysis is actually eight separate reactions but remember our starting molecule is glucose mm -hmm. so there is going to be <clears throat> oh sorry hold on <clears throat> breakfast is fighting back uh, <laughs> Me. Okay. Um, there's an enzyme that is going to be specific for glucose. Okay. And what's going to happen 
is the first part of glycolysis is we're going to stick a phosphate group on to glucose. So we have an enzyme called hexokinase whose sole job is to grab a phosphate group and grab glucose and attach it. And so now we have a new molecule, right? Because it's glucose with something else. So the enzyme hexokinase was responsible for grabbing like glucose, grabbing a phosphate group and attaching them. And then there's gonna be another molecule that's eventually gonna break down, or I'm sorry, another enzyme whose sole job is to grab that glucose plus phosphate and break it down somehow into making a separate molecule. But that original hexokinase, the only thing it does in the cell over and over again is grab a phosphate, grab a glucose, attach them. It grabs a phosphate, grabs another glucose, attaches it. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Thank you. And that's all hexokinase can do. That is its sole purpose in life. <clears throat> okay, hold on. Let me get some coffee so I can quit coughing. Okay. <clears throat> so. With number two, we're now, we're going to skip over metabolism just for right now. We will circle back. With bacterial growth, so I'm going to pull this up for y'all. As you probably remember, there are tons of um, terminology, right? You've got to keep them straight. There could be matching terms with definitions on the exam. A lot of times it's scenarios. So kind of like what you see here. So you've, you know, you're a microbiologist and you've discovered an organism that grows best at a pH of two, right below the surface of the water and at an optimal temperature of 37. How would you describe this organism? All right, so it grows best at a pH of two. Remember, that means it's um, it grows best at an acidic environment. So this is an acidophile right below the surface of water. This is looking at the physical requirement of oxygen and how much oxygen is present in the environment. This would be a micro aerophile because aero means it needs air. Micro means it needs less than normal. So if you think about like the surface of like the ocean, right, with the air, there's tons of oxygen above the surface of the water, right? It's an aerobic environment. But as soon as you, you know, put your head below that water a little bit, there's less oxygen. Okay, and so right below the surface, if that's where organisms live, they're called micro aerophiles. And then optimal temperature of 37 degrees, these are our mesophiles. Okay, so again, just to show you where these are at, so here is our temperature, and then we've got our pH, and then scroll down a little bit, and here's our oxygen. So this is just kind of where I'm getting um, all of this. All right. So for this next one, let's start with pH again. So pH of seven is going to be a neutrophile. I don't know why I listed these in a different order. That's okay. Temperature of 95 degrees Celsius is our hyperthermophile. Hyper means, you know, a lot. Thermo means heat. So just to remind you, oh, that's pH, here we go. Here's our hyperthermophiles. So we're around 95-ish. Thermophiles around 65. Mesophiles are body temperature. This is what pathogens tend to be, right? Because if they infect us and grow in our body, don't they need to have an optimal temperature that's the same as our body, right? So mesophiles tend to be pathogens. All right, let me rephrase that. Pathogens tend to be mesophiles. And then our psychrophiles, you might remember from the video, I hate the cold. So to me, it's psycho to love the love the cold. Although I really don't enjoy the crazy heat anymore either, but not the point. Okay, so let me talk about oxygen real quick because this is what trips a lot of people up on the exam. So it grows best when oxygen is present. Okay, this is going to be um, our facultative anaerobe. So let me go ahead and answer this real quick. <clears throat> okay, so most people are okay with the extremes when it comes to oxygen. So aerobes, 
have to have it. Anaerobes cannot have it. Okay, there are extremes. We already talked about micro aerophiles. They're the ones that grow right below the surface. So they need they need oxygen, but a little bit less than what's just normally in the atmosphere, right above water. So those are kind of those three. The two people often mis uh, mistaken are the facultative anaerobe and the aerotolerant anaerobe. So um, if you'll look at the words, I'm on the right side of my screen now, aerotolerant. So again, aero refers to air and it's tolerant of it, right? When you're tolerating something, that means you don't really like it, right? But you'll survive. Same thing here. These organisms, they can tolerate air. It's not going to kill them, but notice that they're not growing. They are not actively dividing in this situation, okay? They're just gonna kind of wait it out because environments change, right? Maybe we have, I have no idea why, a glass jar with some pond water and some organisms are hanging out. There's some oxygen present, right? Um, but if we screw that lid really, really tight, whoops, you know? Okay, so not the best example. I should have opened it, sorry. I would have opened the jar, um, giving it a lot more oxygen. Maybe they're like, ooh, yuck, I don't want that, right? And they just kind of chill. They kind of go stagnant. And then once there's less oxygen, they'll start doing their thing again. Facultative anaerobes, they don't really care. They grow great if there's oxygen. Um, they grow fine if there's no oxygen. Okay, they grow best um, when there is oxygen, but they have this nifty ab um, ability to switch between aerobic processes and anaerobic processes for metabolism. So they can do both. Again, they do best when oxygen um, is present, but if oxygen suddenly becomes unavailable, they can switch their form of metabolism and still survive, okay? So just make sure you keep aerotolerant and facultative separate. All right, let's do one of these math problems real quick. I have a quick question about yeah, that. absolutely. So I guess what's the difference between like an obligate aerobe and a micro aerophile, like in terms of where it is in the test tube? So... Let's see, can y'all see this PowerPoint slide? Our yes. obligate aerobes are right up here, this far left one where they're all trying to get to the top because that's where all the oxygen is, right? The micro aerophiles are down here right below on the far right. So they're still near the top of the tube, but they're a little bit below because um, you can think of it like a concentration gradient. There is tons of oxygen over here and there's less oxygen down here. So the farther they go in the tube, um, the less oxygen available. So our obligate aerobes, because remember a lot of bacteria move around, right? A lot of them have flagella. So they're all just kind of cruising along up here at the top, getting as close to the surface as they can. But these micro aerophiles are hanging out a little bit underneath so they don't get quite so much oxygen. Does that thank make sense? You. Yes, thank you. All right, yeah, no problem. Okay, I'll make sure I save that. There's gotta be a better way to do this. Okay, so let's go on to this math problem real quick. All right, so we're studying a population of 250 cells. They double or replicate every 30 minutes. How many cells will there be in, 30, in 90 minutes? So we're gonna have, this should be lowercase, but that's okay. So we wanna say how many are we gonna start with? right? We're going to have 250 cells at the beginning. So then our generation time is 30 minutes. So when T equals 30, we'll have more cells. When T equals 60, we'll have even more. When T equals 90, right, we'll have even more. So every 30 minutes, our population is going to double, okay? So the biggest mistake I see with these particular types of questions is people put the 250 here at the 30 minute mark and you don't wanna do that. Because I'm saying we currently have 250 cells before any division has happened, we're starting with 250. So in, we're gonna go three generations, right? 30 minutes, 60 minutes, 90 minutes. So our 250 cells, all of them are going to divide in that first 30 minutes. 
So if every single cell has split into two cells, we now have double, right? So we now have 500 cells. Let's see if I can get a little more separation here. All right, so then in 30 more minutes, all of those cells will have divided. So now we're at a thousand cells. And then 30 minutes later, they're gonna double. So we'll have 2000 cells. So that's our answer, it's gonna be 2000 cells. We feel okay with that? Yes. Wonderful, okay. So sketch and label a bacterial growth curve to save us some time. I'm just gonna show you guys it. So here it is. This is our growth curve. And so I'm gonna talk through this real quick, but you do wanna know the names of the phases and kind of what's happening. So we say I've in like a lab culture cause we're just trying to like connect it to what people experience in this class. And so in lab, in person, we're constantly introducing bacteria to a broth or uh, an auger plate or something. And so when you introduce bacteria to a new broth, and this can be to a new environment out in the, in the wild as well. When you first put bacteria in a new environment, they're kind of like, whoa, 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 what's going on here? Let's kind of assess, is there enough space? Are there enough nutrients, right? So during this lag phase, all the organisms are just kind of adapting to their, their new environment. They're kind of scoping things out, seeing what's going on. Because if they just started dividing right off the bat, what if there wasn't a whole lot of nutrients left, right? They would die out pretty quick. So lag phase, there's a lag in the division or multiplication, however you like to think of it. Bacteria are not actively dividing because they're assessing and adapting, okay? Once they've kind of got a feel for what's going on, then they start to replicate. So now you'll see the number of bacteria in that population is drastically increasing. We say, excuse me, we say exponentially increasing because they're doubling, right? Every 20 to 40 minutes. And so initially that doesn't sound like a lot, right? We have 200 cells, we have 400, we have 800, right? We'll be, but eventually we have a million. Now we have 2 million, now we have 4 million, right? So eventually they're multiplying very, very quickly. So we call this the log phase because it's logarithmic or exponential. So this is where um, a lot of the growth is happening. This is where antibiotics are most effective, right? Because when we take antibiotics, we're trying to shut down the bacteria in some, some way, right? And so bacteria are actively metabolizing. They're actively making DNA and RNA and proteins. They're doing their thing during this log phase. So this is where antibiotics are most effective, right? Because here in the lag phase, if they're just chilling and they're not copying their DNA at the moment, then drugs that shut down DNA replication aren't going to do anything, right? Because they're not actively making more DNA. So log phase is where antibiotics are gonna be most harmful to bacteria. All right, so they're, they're replicating, they're going about their merry way, and then eventually they're gonna run out of space, they're gonna run out of nutrients, and they have to pump the brakes. And they say, whoa, 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 let's all stop dividing and let's hang out and let's see if this situation gets better. Okay, so we call this the stationary phase because as you can see, no real growth. Okay, now there might be a couple cells that are like, I'm gonna divide, but there's also a couple of cells that are gonna die, okay? So there is a little bit of replication, a little bit of death, but it's kind of, they balance each other out. So we say there's no net increase in cells, much like the lag phase, right? There was no real increase in cells. There's no real increase or decrease of cells here either. Now, if things don't change, if they're stuck in that same broth tube okay, or that same jar of pond water, Eventually, they're out of space, they're out of nutrients, there's too many, they can't do anything about it, and they're going to die. So we call this the death phase. It's also called the decline phase. I normally say death phase. But at this point, they start dying quickly because there's no food, right? Just like humans or any other species would do. If we don't have any resources, we're going to die very quickly. Okay, so this is our growth curve. Make sure you know the names of each phase and kind of what's going on. All right. So that's going to kind of wrap up like the big of microbial growth. 
and enzymes. Do we have any questions? Okay. So for number five, this is getting into the controlling microbial growth part. For antimicrobials, I didn't build anything out. Um, let me go ahead and push all of this down. Um, because I've got that mind map. So for now, I'm actually just going to delete these. The mind map is way better than anything I could try to here. <laughs> okay. So when we're talking about controlling microbial growth, with the exception of our antimicrobials, we really kind of divided the conversation into physical methods and chemical methods. Flow charts are fantastic things if you know how to make them. And unfortunately, with my current computer setup, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to draw on here like I normally would. No. Okay. So what we're going to do is say, hey, here's our physical methods. Here's our chemical methods. Okay, what are some examples of our physical methods, right? The big one we use is heat, but you can say temperature here if you'd rather, because technically cold temperatures control microbial heat. I'm sorry, control microbial growth as well, right? That's why we stick our leftovers in the refrigerator. It's too cold for those bacteria to continue to grow. Because, right, if they're, if they um, are replicating on our food as we're eating, which can happen, um, then they prefer room temperature. So that way, when you stick them in the fridge, they're like, ew, yuck, whoa, what is this? And they, they kind of chill. They go stagnant. They're not necessarily dying, but they're not growing. Okay, so you could put temperature here and then add like a line to cold if you want. Heat is really what we talked about in this particular unit. Um, so if if you can, I'm sorry that I can't do it. You'd want to draw a line from heat to this blank box and a separate line from heat to dry. Okay, because remember there are two types of heat control. Moist, so that's what goes here. This is going to be our moist heat. And then we have dry heat. Now, what I would like y'all to do, and again, I'm sorry I can't draw this myself, is coming off of moist, list some examples. So a big one that we use in lab is the autoclave. Okay, the autoclave, um, what we do is we add, we put in everything that we need to sterilize, we add water and we start the machine. And it goes to really high temperature, high pressure, and it basically creates superheated steam, okay? And so that superheated steam is gonna kill everything, including endospores. So the autoclave is an example. Um, boiling water is an example of moist heat control. Now remember, boiling things is not sterilization. Endospores are not gonna be phased by boiled water. Heck, E. coli and staph aren't always phased. That's why if they ever issue a boil notice, they're like, oh, boil things for two minutes. Yet, I mean, that's normally okay to reduce numbers. But I, if you can, I would always boil for longer. Five to 10 minutes is always safer. That's just my own little soapbox, though. I get mad and like, do it for one minute. Like, yeah, they're going to be, pathogens are going to be laughing at you if you do it for one minute. Okay, so again, boiling, um, autoclave. They talked about uh, pasteurization. Okay, now something people often forget on here, so I always like to draw your attention to where I'm talking about. With pasteurization, we talked about two different kinds of pasteurization, okay? And that's why certain things um, need to be stored in the refrigerator, right? Like milk that you buy at the grocery store, certain creamers um, as well. Um, I'm trying to show you where it's located. There we go, okay? So this is the high temperature short time. So as you can see, you don't need to necessarily mem memorize 72 degrees for 15 seconds, okay? But 72 degrees is a high temperature, right? Our body temperature is 37 degrees. So 72 is pretty hot. And for 15 seconds, that's not too long, right? And so it's able to drastically reduce the number of microbes that were in the milk, for instance, right? Because milk comes from cows. Cows have bacteria living in their bodies just like we do. 
So this will drastically reduce the number of microbes in that milk to a very safe level where it can stay in the fridge for a couple of weeks or days. I mean, I guess it really depends, um, right? But that's why you want to follow that expiration date. So high temperature, short time. Great. But you might have seen some coffee creamers, for instance, hanging out on the shelves, right? And or you see them sitting out like at IHOP or something, and they're just kind of there chilling. And it freaks some people out. But a lot of times those types of products that can sit out at room temperature like that have gone through ultra high temperature. So compare these numbers, right? Instead of 72 degrees, it's cranked up to 138. That's really hot, y'all. But because it's really hot, they don't want to destroy the proteins in the milk. They don't want to make the taste go yucky. So they only do it for two seconds. So it's really hot for super fast. And that's going to drastically reduce microbial load so that it can sit there. Like it's, it, We don't say that it's sterile necessarily, um, but it's, it's pretty darn close. Okay, So they can still expire, but it's going to take a lot longer. Okay. So that's why it's without refrigeration. So again, make sure you know these two types of pasteurization and that you just kind of know the difference, right? One's really, really hot for less time than the other. So that's really big temperature. So again, there's some good examples here of each kind. You do not need to read all the details of incineration, but you would need to know that this Bunsen burner, which we use in lab, is a form of dry heat. So off of the word dry here, I would put a line and I would put Bunsen burner. I would put another one that says oven, right? Because there are little hot air ovens that we can, you know, expose our media to, to try to reduce things. Kind of like cooking, right? So just know some examples, okay? But again, you don't need to go in and read every word of these. We've got radiation. Okay, remember when it comes, so that's this one right here. We've got radiation. With that, there's ionizing radiation where it's going to cause breaks in the DNA. We can see how that would be harmful. There's non-ionizing radiation, and that's going to cause thymine dimers. Okay, so that's worth remembering. And basically what that is, is it's causing um, uh, thymines to pair together which as we know from unit one, like that's not what's supposed to happen, right? A's and T's pair together. Well, this is causing neighboring thymines, ones that are right next to each other to bond. And so what that does is it causes um, the DNA molecule to become warped. And so when the DNA becomes warped, it's not gonna be replicated properly without proper replication, right? Organisms aren't gonna be able to survive, okay? And then the middle one here is filtration. This is what we use on like liquids and air, right? When people put on like gas masks, for instance. Um, you can do this with liquids as well. So there's a whole slide on it. So this is really helpful for like antimicrobials that a lot of them um, have like protein qualities. And so you can't subject them to heat. You're not gonna blast them with radiation, right? So we need a separate way to try to get um, microbes out of the air or the, the liquid. And so you can see here, this middle picture, there's a liquid in there that they want to try to get the microbes out of. And what they're going to do is they're going to squirt it through this little filter here, which is the green thing. And that filter, what we're kind of zoomed in on down here, you can see the little holes right in the filter. And look how big a bacterial cell is compared to the little hole in the filter. And so that's why the bacteria are going to get trapped on the filter, but the liquid is going to be able to pass on. Okay. And a similar concept for a mask. That's why we had to wear masks during the COVID times, because the holes in the mask were smaller than the size of a virus particle. It's actually really tiny. Um, so in theory, right, the virus couldn't pass through and, and infect somebody. All right, so that's a very brief overview of our physical methods. Make sure you get the gist of each one. With our chemical methods, we talked about alcohols, hydrogen peroxide, and this one is going to be our surfactants. And so with alcohols, right, they're very effective. Okay, so just to, again, show you where these are um, at is over here. These are really good 
Okay, notice they um, can get most microbes, which is really great, but they don't get endospores, right? So this is not a form of sterilization. The big issue with alcohols is that they evaporate really quick. Okay, so they're not, there's not going to be a very long contact time. So some microbes aren't going to be as affected by it because it just dries before it can do any damage. Peroxide um, is really effective. This is effective on living tissue and on um, uh, fomites, inanimate objects like countertops or whatever. Um, when it comes, though, to living tissue, I, let me kind of rephrase that. If you have like a little scratch on your arm, a very minor surface wound, peroxide's not going to do you any good because a lot of the bacteria on our skin or right below the surface of our skin have the enzyme catalase. So if you've been watching some of the lab content, we know that catalase is an enzyme that breaks down hydrogen peroxide into water and gaseous oxygen, aka bubbles, right? So if you're anything like me, you, if you ever cut yourself, right, you choose peroxide over alcohol because it doesn't sting. And you see the bubbles and you're like, yeah, die bacteria. Really, that's the bacteria laughing at you because they have catalase. So as you add some peroxide, they're breaking it down into bubbly oxygen, okay? Now, if you have a deep wound and you flood it with peroxide, that is more effective, okay? Like with any enzyme, you can overwhelm them, right? There is a saturation point. You can't just add infinite amounts of substrate doesn't work that way. So if you're flooding it with peroxide, then yes, you can overwhelm catalase and it can destroy bacteria. So hydrogen peroxide um, is okay for deep wounds and for fomites, so but especially fomites. Surfactants, these are like soaps and detergents. And y'all, what you want to remember about these is that surfactants are amphipathic. Okay, remember amphipathic means it has hydrophobic qualities and hydrophilic qualities. That's important, okay? And why is it important? Because if we um, think about our hands after just a normal day, okay? They're oily, right? Our skin gets oily. Oils are hydrophobic. Those oils tend to trap pathogens, bacteria in general, dirt, grime, right? All the nasty. And so... We need our soaps and our detergents to be able to kind of grab hold of the oils and all the things that are stuck in the oil, right? That's what happens when you first put soap on your hands and you're rubbing your hands together. You're, you're um, letting the soap surfactant grab a hold of all that oil and grime, okay? Then when you put your hands back under the water to wash it off, that water is gonna grab the hydrophilic part of that soap and yank the grime, dirt, bacteria off your hands and wash it down the sink. Okay, so that's why it's really important that surfactants are amphipathic. Hydrophobic part binds to all the nasty and the hydrophilic will then grab hold of the water and yank the oils and stuff off your hand and it'll go down the drain. Same thing like with your clothes and stuff, okay? It gets all oily and nasty. Um, especially if you have like stains. Um, so the surfactants are really important for that. All right, y'all. How are we feeling so far? I know we're close to 11. Don't worry. I'll get through this pretty quick. Any questions on everything but metabolism? I have a, just a specific question. Sure. Um, it's okay if there's not time for it. So when you were talking about hydrogen peroxide, I know that I'm, I'm just curious, like the, how it's affected when there's like, if one of my kids get a bloody nose, I'll put hydrogen peroxide on their clothes to get the blood out or mm -hmm. the cloth. What, what's happening there? Like, how does it get, how does it get the blood out? But then like soaps and things like that don't always. You know, I'm going to be very honest with you because I had the, I was told the same thing when I had a baby. And they were like, you know, they gave her a shot and stuff. Like she may bleed, put peroxide on it. Mm -hmm. And I honestly, I don't know. I don't okay. know how that does, but I will look into that and I will let you know. Okay. Cause I've seen it even on like, like white cloth or carpet or something. Yeah. I now use that. It, I don't normally have them put everywhere, yeah. but yeah, I use that too, especially with kids. Right. Right. And so yeah, me, just, I don't know the chemical reaction that's happening with blood and peroxide, but I will look into that. 
Okay, thank you. All right, so let's talk metabolism really quickly, okay? We talked about three processes. We focus on aerobic respiration, which is also called cellular respiration. And these are all catabolic processes. Because remember, catabolic processes or catabolism is breaking things down to release energy, okay? So with all of these, we start with glucose and we're breaking it down to get some energy, okay? An example of an anabolic reaction would be like DNA replication, okay, right? Because we're building DNA, we're adding nucleotides to build something. When we're building RNA, we're building proteins. Anytime you're building or making, that's anabolic. Here, we're going to break some stuff down. So we have two types of respiration. Remember, the big difference here, y'all, is one um, requires oxygen and one does not. But as you're going to see here in just a second, the steps are pretty darn similar to each other. These processes are not wildly different from one another. Okay? If they were wildly different, they wouldn't both be called respiration. Okay, Fermentation is very, it's short and sweet. Okay? We're going to get through this in like 20 seconds. All right, so real quick, let's go ahead and start filling this out. For cellular respiration, again, also called aerobic, our first step is going to be glycolysis. This literally means sugar splitting. So during this process, okay, glucose is going to be converted into two molecules of pyruvate. So some detail you don't necessarily need. Glucose is considered large. It is six carbons plus other things. Um, and pyruvate is small. It's only three carbons. So it's called sugar splitting because this large six carbon molecule will be split into two smaller three carbon molecules. Okay, so again, that's why it's catabolic. We have broken down glucose. Now, I'm actually gonna see if I can take up some of fermentation space because we won't need it as much. And honestly, we're not gonna need a ton of anaerobic. So let's use this. So in doing so, in splitting glucose to pyruvate, we're also going to get two molecules of usable energy. ATP is usable. That's why it's so valuable. As soon as it's made, the cell can turn around and use it. We're also going to make two molecules of stored energy. That is NADH. Okay. And this is stored energy because it's not usable right away. Okay. Now remember, NADH and FADH2 are electron carriers, okay? So when you think about bonds, like things that hold glucose together, bonds are pairs of electrons, okay? And as we break molecules down, we're breaking those pairs of electrons. And we don't want these bonds that have been broken, we don't wanna be releasing electrons into the cell. They're negatively charged, right? They would wreak havoc on everything. And so these electron carriers, NAD plus and FADH, they grab hold of them. I'm sorry, FAD. They grab hold of them and they hold on to pairs of electrons. So that's where we get NADH um, and FADH2. So these are stored energy. They're going to be um, important later. So I'm put stored. All right. So that's step one. Remember, this happens in the um, cytosol as well. And it requires oxygen. That's important. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It doesn't require oxygen. Sorry, I was getting ahead of myself. Doesn't require oxygen. That means it can happen if oxygen is present, and it can happen if oxygen is not present. Okay? So I would definitely remember, remember this. What's the big reaction happening? Where is it happening? And any, like, important notes. Pretend I know how to spell. All right. So after this, we have pyruvate, okay? Because the ATP is going to go get used. The NADH is heading to the electron transport chain. More on that later. So we've got some pyruvate that we need to deal with. There's still energy stored in that pyruvate. So we need to keep breaking it down. So here, the pyruvate is going to get converted to acetyl-CoA. And it's a one-to-one -one ratio. For every one pyruvate, we make one acetyl-CoA. 
And we also get one molecule of stored energy in the form of NADH. But if you look up to step one, we made two pyruvates, right? So each pyruvate is going to get converted to an acetyl-CoA and an NADH. So I'm just going to go ahead and put a two here in front of all of these. So at this point, though, y'all, now we are in the mitochondria, specifically the mitochondrial matrix, which is just in the inner part of the mitochondria. And from here on out, oxygen is required, must be present. Okay, it's not optional like it was in glycolysis. All right, well, y'all, acetyl-CoA still made up of bonds. We can still get some energy from it. So our next step, oh, I'm sorry, I should have told y'all what this was called, my apologies. So we call this the linking step, but the official name is pyruvate oxidation. Now you might think, oh my gosh, what does that even mean? Well, it's always looking at, sorry y'all, what we're starting with, right? So we're starting with pyruvate, just like up here, glycolysis, we were starting with glucose, right? Oxidation means to break something down, right? Remember oil rig, oxidation is loss of electrons because we broke it down, like the molecule has lost its electrons. Reduction is gain, okay? That means it's gaining electrons. So pyruvate oxidation is just a fancy way of saying we're breaking down pyruvate, which we did, right? We broke it down into a very small molecule called acetyl-CoA. All right, so now we've got acetyl-CoA, we need to do something with it. So now we have the Krebs cycle. And now we're gonna do one acetyl-CoA at a time, okay? So one acetyl-CoA is going to enter the citric acid cycle, and it's going to give us one ATP, one NADH, and one FADH2. Okay, so this is, I'm going to put an S here. That is stored energy. Here's a, another form of stored energy, and ATP is our usable energy. So again, that ATP is going to be used up right away. This is the only place that FADH2 is made, might be worth remembering. Okay, and if you look at our products now, all we have is energy, right? There is no more molecules that we can break down. So we're done with the breaking things down part, okay? Now, I told y'all that only one acetyl-CoA can go in at a time, okay? So one acetyl-CoA goes in, it cranks out all this energy, and then we need to kickstart the cycle again. It's a cycle, it goes over and over and over again. So for the next you know, cycle to begin, another acetyl-CoA enters in and it gets broken down, releases all these forms of energy, so on and so forth, okay? So one acetyl-CoA goes in at a time, but how many do we currently have? Two, right? So, <clears throat> so when we're thinking about cellular respiration, starting with one molecule of glucose, we're going to do two turns of this Krebs cycle, right? Because we have two acetyl-CoAs. So one's going to go in and crank out ATP, NADH, and FADH2. Then the second one comes in, cranks out another ATP, another NADH, <coughs> and another FADH2. And y'all, please, I made a typo. Three NADHs there. My apologies. Per turn, we get three NADH. So per molecule of glucose, though, because we had two acetyl-CoAs, we're going to do two turns. So per starting molecule of glucose, we've broken it down to pyruvates. Those got converted to acetyl-CoAs. One acetyl-CoA goes in at a time. We've got two of them. So we do two turns of the Krebs cycle. So at the end of the day, we walk away with this right? Double everything that I just said, because we've done two turns. Okay, so again, now all we have left is energy. So we're going to come down here to our final step called oxidative phosphorylation. And this is where we have our electron transport chain plus chemiosmosis. So with the electron transport chain, this is where our electron carriers go, okay? So this was all still in the mitochondrial matrix. 
This, I'm gonna try and save over space, is in the inner mitochondrial membrane, okay? So the NADHs and the FADH2s that have been made throughout this process, okay? All of these make their way to the inner mitochondrial membrane. They drop off those electrons that they've been holding on to at the electron transport chain, okay? And remember, the electron transport chain is like a game of hot potato. It passes the electrons from one protein to the next, hence electron transfer, transferring electrons down a chain of proteins. And it ends up at ATP synthase. And that's gonna be what cranks out all that ATP. Okay. All right, so the one thing I wanna mention about this, we're gonna switch over to lab here in just a second is that there are two ways that ATP is made. Okay, one is called substrate level phosphorylation. I know it's a crazy word, but do we see phosphate in phosphorylation? So phosphorylation just means we're sticking a phosphate group onto something, okay? So in this case, that means we're taking ADP, we're gonna add a phosphate group, and that's gonna make ATP, okay? Adenosine diphosphate means it's got two phosphates on it, but we need it to have three phosphates. So we're gonna stick a phosphate group on it, okay? And then the other way ATP is made is through this last step, oxidative phosphorylation, and that's involving ATP synthase, okay? So ATP synthase is with oxidative phosphorylation, Substrate level is essentially stealing. What that means is we've got this ADP, this adenosine diphosphate. It's got two phosphates on it. We need three. So what happens is an enzyme just literally goes and snatches a phosphate group from a nearby molecule. It just takes it and it sticks it onto ADP. It says, woohoo, there's ATP. So substrate level phosphorylation is just stealing. So when you see ATP prior to this fourth step, so here at the Krebs cycle and here at glycolysis, these ATPs are made by substrate level phosphorylation, right? Because ATP synthase isn't involved. ATP synthase and oxidative phosphorylation are here. Okay, now very quickly, I'm gonna summarize these two. Anaerobic respiration. Oh, actually, let me add something real quick. So down here, big important detail, Oxygen is the final electron acceptor. That's why oxygen is required, okay? Because remember, they were hot potatoing these electrons. They were passing them around. Well, something has to take them and accept them and hold on to them, or else, again, we'd have negative charges running around our cell. Everybody would die. So oxygen is like, fine, fine, fine. I will hold on to them. And when oxygen accepts those two electrons, it needs to balance itself out. It grabs some hydrogen protons and it becomes water, okay? So here's why this is an aerobic process because oxygen is that final electron acceptor hanging out near the electron transport chain, catching all those electrons. Well, anaerobic respiration means no oxygen, okay? So we're still gonna see glycolysis and these same things happening. So we're still gonna make pyruvate. So we still need that linking step, okay? So that's still gonna happen. Now, this there is a slightly modified Krebs cycle and you don't need to know how it's modified. It's not quite as efficient. We're not gonna quite get as much energy from it, okay? Uh, but we're still having it. It has its own form of um, electron transport chain. It's got, um, I'm just out of space here, so I'm really abbreviating what I type. Um, it's got ATP synthase. It's got an electron transport chain, right? Again, same song and dance, maybe slightly different proteins involved. Again, this is not quite as efficient as aerobic respiration. We don't get as many ATPs, but it's all this very similar processes. The big difference is no oxygen, okay? It's gonna use nitrate or sulfate as that final electron acceptor because these organisms cannot handle oxygen. So therefore oxygen can't be a final electron acceptor. Okay, but again, notice same big picture steps. 
right? Fermentation is just glycolysis plus some other reaction. There's no pyruvate oxidation. There's no Krebs cycle. There's no, um, you know, ATP synthase or anything like that. So fermentation only makes two molecules of ATP. That's it. Okay. So only two ATP total. And this is normally an anaerobic process. So again, no oxygen. Remember, this is why it was important that I told y'all oxygen doesn't require oxygen. Because notice, this is the only step that all three catabolic processes have in common, right? Because it doesn't require oxygen. All of these steps did. Which is why even though anaerobic respiration has a version of the Krebs cycle, it's got a version of the electron transport chain, it's not identical, okay? And it's not quite as efficient. So in summary, aerobic respiration produces the most ATP, most efficient, then anaerobic respiration, and then fermentation comes in last with only two ATPs. All right, I do wanna talk about lab a little bit. Are there any lecture related questions that I can answer for y'all? And I can stay past 11.30 if you do have questions that you wanna talk about. Lab, since we're just getting into lab unit two, there's not a whole lot that I want to tell you, um, but I do want to talk about the unknowns. So are there any lecture questions? I don't see anything in the, in the chat. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and switch over to lab, if that's okay. And I am actually going to create a blank presentation as well that I'm going to, for unknowns. But first I want to talk about unit two a little bit. If I get out. Okay. So with lab unit two, uh, it's a bit different. From here on out, lab is a little different than the approach we took during unit one. Okay. With unit two, we are trying to identify unknown organisms that are gram positive cocci. So a lot of gram-positive cocci are pathogens. So we need ways to quickly um, identify them. So with the gram-positive cocci, especially the ones that we're focusing on, we can divide them into the staphylococci or the streptococci. And you can probably guess how they differ from one another. One has the staphylo clustery arrangement, one's got strepto. Okay, so the eight unknowns for this unit are listed here. We have Staphylococcus aureus, Staphylococcus epidermidis. We got Streptococcus pyogenes, Streptococcus agalactiae, Streptococcus bovis, Streptococcus pneumoniae, Streptococcus sanguinis, and our kind of little oddball here, Enterococcus fecalis. Now, this organism used to be called Streptococcus fecalis because it tends to make um, strepto arrangement of cocci cells. But once we were able to study it more, we actually found out that it's not like the other streptococci very much. Um, so we changed its name. And it takes a lot, y'all, to change a name once it's been published. It takes a lot. So, um, so here are six of our unknown organisms belong to the group streptococci. Two of them belong to the group staphylococci. Okay, and so here's, here's a picture. So notice mainly uh, in chains, there'll be a couple that might be diplo, like you see um, here in the middle picture, and then our staphylos, right, lots of clusters. Okay, so we need to figure out how do we identify them. So for your unknown assignment, you are doing it in pieces. So the first part of it is what we're worried about now, and that is how do we identify a gram-positive unknown bacteria. So if y'all were in my in-person class, you would come into lab one day and I would hand you a broth and I would say, go figure out what it is, which sounds terrifying, right? I remember, I will never forget unknowns when I did them. I actually took a whole summer class of just unknowns. It was fun, but it was terrifying and stressful, but it's doable because we have these media that we use that will help us figure out what things are. So um, when you're dealing with a gram-positive cocci organism, you want to figure out, well, which group does it belong to, okay? Um, 
Now you might say, uh, Chelsea, why don't you look under the microscope? And you can, okay? But let's say for some reason you didn't, okay? You know that it's gram positive, but you don't know what group it belongs to. Sounds weird, I know, but just go with it. One thing you can do is the catalase test, okay? Because this will give you either positive or negative results. And it turns out that the staphylococci are, um, are positive, the streptococci are negative. So this is a way to confirm, right? Because some people, when you do staining, it's very easy to be too rough with your cells and make it so that you lose that staphylo arrangement or you lose that strepto arrangement. Staining is a very delicate process, okay? So that's also another reason why you may not trust what you see under the microscope. So with catalase, and I wanna talk about this a little bit because a big part of this lab unit is identifying what you see here, observation, results, and interpretation, okay? And so your observation is what you physically see. Okay? I cannot see the enzyme catalase, right? I cannot see you know, fermentation happening, right? It's too small, we can't see it. So when you're thinking about observation, it's what can you physically see? So normally it's something like this, bubbles, or lack of bubbles. Maybe it's a color change. My media is pink. My media is yellow, right? Things I can see. Results are typically positive or negative. Because a lot of time there are two possible outcomes, right? It bubbled or it didn't. That's it. One of two options. So normally the results are positive or negative. There are exceptions. And in the lab videos, I am very clear when those are exceptions. And so notice you need one symbol or one word when for results. Your interpretation is when you get sciency. You're telling me, why am I observing bubbles? What, what does a positive result mean? Okay, this is the science. So for this one, we say the organism has catalase and can break down peroxide into gaseous oxygen, aka bubbles, right? And water, but what we're seeing is the bubbles. So the interpretation is the so what. What does it mean that we have bubbles? What does it mean that we have a positive reaction? Okay, so the science is the interpretation. So do we feel okay with observation versus result versus interpretation? Yes. Okay, and so throughout this, all the videos and things, I will keep like reiterating them. I notice I don't type them out for you because I want you to be watching them in the video. Um, so catalase is normally one of the first things you do if you suspect you have a gram positive cocci is you want to do catalase. So let's take this now real quick and look into, let me move this zoom bar. What does this mean for your unknown assignment? Okay. Part one, again, is lab two focused. You are making part of a flow chart that allows you to, um, to identify an unknown. And um, what you want to do, if you've never made a flowchart, is you're going to go through here and figure out the order that you do things. Okay, so I just told y'all catalase is one of the first things that you do. But what you have to remember is this flowchart is going to be for both unit two and three. So unit two is gram positive, unit three is gram negative. So what should be at the tippity top of our flow chart here if we're trying to identify some unknown? What should we do first? If you want to tell if it's gram positive or gram negative, what do we do first? The gram stain, right? So I'm again, I'm abbreviating here just to save us some time. So y'all's flow chart for your unknowns had better start with the gram stain. Now, if you look at the handout, which I, I don't have up right now, your flow chart includes three important things. The name of the test or the media, which right here, I have gram stain. The possible outcomes. So let's talk about that. If we do a gram stain, do we agree that our two outcomes are gram positive or gram negative, right? And it doesn't matter if you put positive on the left or right. It's just how I think. And then the third thing is the organism name itself, which for the flow chart y'all are going to be working on, that's these guys. So again, one, two, and then there's six over here on the right-hand side. Okay, 
So for this unit, we are focusing on our gram positives. So you are building out on what I've drawn as the left-hand side. So what did I say you do first to figure out if you have a staphylococci or a streptococci? Somebody tell me, what test did we just talk about? Catalase. There we go. All right. So again, we're focusing on our gram positive. So I'm drawing a line from here. Because think of this as like a roadmap. If I do the gram saying I get positive, I better do my catalase next. And notice, I'm not talking about observations and interpretations and all of that. That's not the purpose. We've got catalase next. What were my two outcomes, y'all? Positive and negative. There we go, yep. So again, we're focusing on our results here, our outcomes. Positive and negative. Okay, so now you're not, you wouldn't put this on your flow chart, but I'm just, I'm just making sure I'm teaching y'all. So again, these are our staffs. Again, this does not go on your flow chart. And over here, our negatives are the streps. And this is important because now as we go through, let's go to our next um, media here. Manitol salt auger, salt tolerant organisms can grow on this media. And as you watch the lab video, I tell you our staphylococci are the salt tolerance. So where do you think MSA is going to go? Am I going to connect it to my positive or my negative? Positive? Yeah, because our catalase positives are our staphs. Okay, there are salt tolerance. That's why things like MRSA, um, which is methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus um, and Staphylococcus epidermidis. So let me actually kind of backtrack a little bit. Okay, do you see the epidermidis, right? Sounds like skin. These can inhabit the skin and our skin is a salty environment, right? We sweat, sweat is salty. So our staphs love salt. Our streps cannot handle salt. So it wouldn't make any sense to do a salt-related media with our streps at this point, right? Because we'd kill them all. <laughs> so here from our gram positives, now we're doing MSA, okay? And with this media, right, we're only doing it on our, our staffs. So this particular slide is not relevant, right? Because um, if you've watched the videos for this media, if you try to put a streptococci on the MSA, it's gonna die, right? Because I told you that streps can't handle the salt. Um, so that's what this is here just to show you. It's like, hey, it's selective. This media prevents salt intolerant organisms from growing. So that's why it's called a selective media. It selects for and against certain things. But if we put our staffs on here, Right, we have two of them. So if you streak Staphylococcus epidermidis on here, do we see how there's growth and the media is pink? Well, notice with this option, there's growth and it's yellow. So do we agree? These are two different outcomes, right? And so, and I'm not gonna fill all of this out for you, but essentially there's two outcomes here, right? So I'm gonna put question mark, question mark, because this is for you to fill out. But at this point, y'all, notice one of them gives us epidermidis. So I'm just going to pick this one again. You look and figure it out for yourself, which I know you can do. I'm going to abbreviate, which you will not do on your unknown. And then the other staff that we have, we've only got two, is going to be RS aureus. Okay. Now, I want y'all to notice real quick, because this confuses a lot of people. Do we see how there's one of our staff organisms here? But do y'all remember this guy? Enterococcus fecalis. So I'm saying enterococcus can handle salt and it turns yellow, which means it can ferment mannitol. But you might be going, uh, Chelsea, where do we see E. fecalis? It's on our strep side. Didn't we just say streps die with salt? Well, remember I told y'all that we changed the name of E. fecalis because it didn't behave like all the other streps. So it belongs to the group streptococci because it does form chains of circular cells, but it doesn't behave like the streptococcus genus, okay? All of these streptococcus pyogenes, streptococcus agulactiae, et cetera, et cetera, they cannot handle salt. This is why enterococcus has a different genus because it's the weirdo, it can handle salt, but 
But right now we're building out this side of our flow chart that's only for our staffs. So do I need to worry about putting Ife Callis over here? No, because it belongs to the group streptococci, which is catalase negative. So Ife Callis does not belong over here. This is why um, I didn't include it. So at this point, y'all, you know, always remember, we need to underline or italicize our organisms and you would spell it out completely, capitalize your genus or naming. We're done with our staffs. Woohoo! Our streps are a bit more involved, okay? But as you work through this, y'all, okay, if you read the um, handout, we don't include coagulase on our, on our thing. So notice y'all here, blood auger plate, do you see I tell you which group we're worried about? I tell you your possible outcomes. So we don't have a positive negative situation here and y'all haven't gotten to this in lab yet, okay? So I'm, I'm not gonna go into the details, but with blood auger, you're not gonna just have positive negative, okay? So ignore the, the flow chart here. When you get to blood auger plates, this one has three outcomes. So you're, it's gonna look more like this, okay? But notice, okay, I'm giving y'all directions on where it goes on your roadmap. We're gonna do these with the streptococci, okay? And I tell you ones that might get there, okay? So when you notice though, that for our three outcomes, notice we have gamma, alpha, and beta. Do you see how each of them have two options here? What that means is we're not done at blood auger, okay? If we have an alpha, well, we got to differentiate between these two. So we need another media to be done. So I'm just going to put X here, X media, okay? And it's going to help us identify which one is S pneumoniae and which is S sanguinis, okay? Now, again, you haven't probably watched these videos yet. So you're going to need to take some time to digest it. But do we do we kind of see what we're doing for this first part of the unknown project? It's okay if the answer is no. <laughs> but I'm hoping we're at least starting to see what we're what we're doing. And y'all, as you work on this, um, okay, it's almost time to be done. So I'm going to go ahead and, and stop sharing real quick. This will be posted, so you'll still have it. Um, but what I want to emphasize that is as y'all are working on this, reach out to me if you have questions. If you want to sketch a draft and you're like, Chelsea, will you take a look at this? I will take a look, okay? And I'll give you some feedback. Now, I won't say you need to move this here and that here, but I might say, hey, let's rethink about your MSA, okay? Are you sure that Staphylococcus epidermidis is negative or positive or whatever the case may be? Okay, so I will try and guide you. If you're like, hey, I'm stuck. I don't know how to figure this out. Then I will help explain it to you. But I'm not just going to give you the answer, kind of like with a known one, right? Um, you're learning when you're grappling with material. I know it's not fun. <laughs> Been there, done that. Um, but just remember, you can do it. All the information you need is in the lab notes and the PowerPoint. Um, and I am here to help you. Are there any questions? Um, on the unknown, and I'm happy to go back and review coagulase and MSA a little bit more um, with our remaining time. Are there any unknown questions? Okay, well then in our final minute and a half, I'm gonna go back to um, these two lab um, media that we didn't talk about and hit them really quick. I'm going to skip over MSA right now just because it is um, more involved. So I can knock out coagulase pretty quick. Notice this ends in ASE. We call this the coagulase test because we're looking to see if the organism produces the enzyme coagulase, much like with the catalase test. We we're trying to see if they make catalase. So coagulase um, causes coagulation, again, hence the name. Use the names as hints, y'all, to help kind of reduce the cognitive load of memorizing all this stuff. So to coagulate means to clot. So if an organism has coagulase, it causes coagulation or clotting. And this is really helpful for pathogens because they can essentially create clots in the body that they can hide behind, so they can replicate safely, right? Because our immune cells are going to be going after them. So it's harder for our immune cells to get to them if there's all these clots that they're hiding behind, right? So 
what you really want to be looking at here is again observations results and interpretations so what can we see here we can see clotting or no clotting that's our observation because there's two outcomes here we've got positive if it clots negative if it doesn't and again our interpretation is the science what does it mean why did we see clotting because the organism has the enzyme coagulase we did not see clotting here because it does not have coagulase. Now you might be asking, well, Chelsea, why is clotting positive? Why isn't it negative? Because a positive result happens when something has changed. So when you first get this media, it's liquid. You introduce your bacteria to this liquidy media, you stick it in the incubator. And when you come back, if it's still liquidy, that means nothing happened, right? because it does not have the enzyme. It did not clot. That's why it's negative. Negative, think of it as like no change. So you saw no change because there was no enzyme. But here, the clot is a change. Something happened. And it happened because the enzyme is present. So a change of some kind is positive. If no change, nothing happened negative. Okay, so I know we're at time. If you need to go, I totally get it. I'm going to do a very quick summary of MSA. So what I want you to notice with mannitol salt auger, the name tells you everything. So it's good to remember what MSA stands for. This is what the plate normally looks like. It's this pretty reddishy light pink color. This is what it normally looks like. And so because it's a plate, you would streak your organism onto it. Okay. Now, it contains salt, right? So only salt-tolerant organisms can grow, which is why if we put any of the Streptococcus species on here, they won't grow because they can't handle salt and they die. Okay, so no growth, still that same pink color, okay? But what happens if you do put an organism that can live on it? Well, there's two options. One is that it's going to tolerate the salt. So again, we see growth in both scenarios, right? Because they like salt. Salt doesn't phase them. So we need to be able to differentiate between our two salt-loving organisms. That's where the differential media comes in. So how do we differentiate them? Well, that's going to be the mannitol part. This is a sugar. One of these organisms can ferment the sugar mannitol and one cannot. So let's look at this organism first. This is what you get if you put Staphylococcus epidermidis on this plate. So we see that there's growth, but do you see how the plate is the same color, right? This is what it looked like to begin with. It's still a reddishy pink color. That means nothing happened. It survived the salt and it grew, but it did not ferment anything because there's no, no change, okay? So this is our negative plate because there was no fermentation, nothing happened here except the organism could grow. Notice this next organism, y'all. Do you see how it is no longer pink? There has been a change of some sort, in this case, a color change. Most things will be a color change. And so if there's a big change to the media, then that means, yes, something happened. In this case, the organism fermented mannitol. So this is our positive plate because it changed color, okay? So yellow with growth is a positive result, okay? And this, if we're only worried about our staphs, we know it's Staphylococcus aureus. If on a lab exam, I said, hey, you did this in the lab, what could it possibly be? Technically, it can be either of them, okay? So if I don't give you any more information like, oh, it's catalase positive or it's a staph, then it can technically be either. For our flow chart, we are only worried about our staphs, which is why it, it gives us Staphylococcus aureus, okay? So if there's a change in the or starting uh, media, then that's gonna be our positive reaction. All right, y'all, it's 1134. Are there any questions about this that I can answer for you? I'm going to stop sharing. I am going.